Bom, bom dia a todos e todas. É um enorme prazer receber hoje é, no nosso ciclo de palestra a, a, a Carol. A Carol vai falar. A Carol ela tem trabalhado com uma série de, uma série de problemas interessantes. Ela ela fez é, em relacionadas a interações animal-planta, em particular palmeiras, né? Ao estudo de palmeiras, usando palmeiras como objeto de estudo. Ela fez graduação e mestrado na UFRJ. É, depois ela foi à França, fez um doutorado é, em Paris, e depois ela trabalhou, com, trabalhou e trabalha como pós-doc na Universidade de Amsterdã. E agora ela está voltando para o Brasil, né? já voltou fisicamente para o Brasil, e ela vai contar um pouquinho para a gente do, desse trabalho sobre interações entre palmeiras e animais frugívoros. É, vários trabalhos recentes da Carol têm focado, que ela é a primeira autora ou coautora, co focado em, em, em interações, é, em aspectos dessa interação ecológica. E acredito que hoje a gente vai ter um panorama bem geral sobre é, esses achados, então não vou dar spoiler nenhum. Carol, muito obrigado aí por tirar um tempinho para contar para a gente. A palestra será em inglês, porque há pessoas na audiência que não falam português, Uh, mas qualquer dúvida no final, pode, as perguntas podem ser feitas em português, inglês ou na forma que a pessoa quiser tentar, e, tem, e tentar se comunicar tá bom? Carol, a sala é sua, obrigado de novo e quando você quiser você pode começar Obrigada, Miúdo Obrigada por pela, pela apresentação é, Só um instante, está é, aparecendo essa, esse quadrado amarelo não está? Sim. Como é que eu tiro isso? Você sabe? Não. <risos> não sei, não. Nem isso eu. Isso não é o vídeo? Ah, foi. Mas, ele, mas ele não devia estar aparecendo, não? Mas aí está falando que dá para mover, né? Pois é. Mas eu tento mover e não consigo. Quer tentar compartilhar de novo a tela? É. Esse... Tá bom. Não se preocupe, que depois a gente edita. Dá para editar, cortar. Aprendi a fazer essas coisas. <risos> Agora parece que não está aparecendo, né? Isso, mas não vamos comemorar muito, vamos deixar aí. <risos> e se apareceu, eu, eu falo com vocês, tá bom. É, so, I'm going to switch to English, and I hope you can all understand me. So, thanks a lot, Mildo, for the invitation. It's, a, it's really a, a pleasure to, to be here today talking to you about my work. And what I'm going to present today is on uh, it's my most recent work on 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 palms and fruit forests. And the, this talk is entitled uh, "The Mutualism Antagonism Continuum in Neotropical Palm Fruit Forest Interactions from Interaction Outcomes to Ecosystem Dynamics." And this work I've de developed while um, associated to the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and it has been developed together with Daniel Kisling. And uh, yeah, I'm going to show you the results of uh, this, this work. Okay. So when we look at uh, these tropical biomes, and uh, this, this photo here is of um, Uh, the Amazon forest in French Guiana, where I developed my I have some field work during my PhD. When we look at those at those huge forests, what we see right there standing are the trees. Now we see this huge diversity of 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 plants. But what we don't see immediately is that uh, uh, are the, the the species interactions. So these forests. They, they're there because there are so many species interacting and they're facilitating ecological processes that shape those ecological communities. 
And today I'm going to talk about those those species interactions and uh, mainly palm fruitbar, plant fruitbar interaction. And a tendency that we have uh, when we when we are working with species inter interactions that we group interactions into in, as antagonisms and mutualisms. And antagonisms are the species, uh, the interactions in which one species benefits, but it, this comes at the cost of the other. And these we can, uh, for example, cite the, the seed predation by frugivores or by invertebrates, as the brookie beetle that we see on the left uh, below, or yet uh, we can also think of herbivory. And those interactions, they, they come with a, a, a big cost for the plants because the animals, they benefit from the interactions but the plants don't. On the other side, on the right side, we see interactions that uh, we classify as mutualisms. And th those interactions, they involve species that benefit, all, both species benefit from the interaction. So the classic examples that I bring here are pollination. This is a picture of the of the pollination, pollinate, uh, a bee pollinating the flower of the Castanha do Pará tree, the Brazilian nut. And we also have uh, frugivores that act as seed dispersers, so they consider the mutualist species, mutualist animal. And today, as you can as you know by my title, I'm going to talk about frugivory. And by frugivory, I include uh, animals, uh, vertebrates that feed on palm fruits, sorry, on fruits and seeds, uh, regardless of the outcome of the interaction, if they result in, in antagonisms or mutualism. And this way of thinking uh, about interactions, they, it has shaped widely the way we think uh, uh, on the ecological and evolutionary process, because when we separate interactions as with seed predators, the antagonists and seed dispersers, it influences how we, how we perceive their ecological role. So seed predators, we consider, uh, we consider them predators because they, they consume fruits and seeds without uh, uh, associated, an associated benefit for plants. While in mutualisms, uh, mutualistic frugivore interactions, the animals act as seed dispersers. So there is a kind of an exchange of food that is provided by the plant and the seed transport that the animals uh, promote. However, what we see, what we know with accumulated research is that those plant frugivore interactions, they actually, most of them involve costs and benefits for the plant. So they, neither, they, they often, although we classify them in antagonisms or mortalisms, we know that there, there might be some, more, some other variation there that we, we don't assess. And one way of uh, assessing this variation is quantifying, for example, seed dispersal effectiveness. And this framework, uh, that has been published, I think the first time was 1993 by Eugene Schupp. And this on the right, on the left is a, a, a review of, from 2010, in which he discuss, they discuss how to uh, assess the dispersal effectiveness of frugivores by separating the dispersal into two uh, components, the quantitative com component and the qualitative component. And to assess how animals act as frugivores, as seed dispersers, they incorporate many variables that can affect those two components. And this is a way of incorporating variation, right? And this can be used in many ways. And on the right, we see a paper in which they, uh, they show these interaction modes that we see below on the, on the figure. To that represent this variation and how animals are or are strong mutualists or weak antagonists or there is a, a, a wide variation of uh, of outcomes. But 
I've always been thinking, I, I always think about how this, the term itself, seed dispersal effectiveness, uh, puts a, a focus on the seed dispersal process as the most important um, benefit that comes from frugivores. But uh, how does, how, how using seed dispersal and focusing on seed dispersal can affect uh, our understanding of uh, the full range of consequences of frugivores have on, on plant population dynamics. So if we, we think what makes a frugivore a mutualist or an antagonist, we can think that uh, different animals can impact uh, mainly the seed to seedling transition. So the fruit is produced, animals handle or interact or consume these fruits. It affects uh, directly or indirectly the seed viability of seeds. Uh, how, where to where they disperse the seeds affects the seed deposition. So seed dispersal is right there mainly associated or, ex or like implicit in the seed deposition. And they also uh, have effects on the seedling establishment. But Quantifying how frugivores affect those transitions is really very, really, really challenging because it is difficult to track seeds after they are consumed. There are so many different processes and uh, two uh, in multiple steps that are involved in, in consumption of fruits by animals. But maybe to reply to this question, what makes a frugivore materialist or antagonistic? Uh, antagonist species. We, one way to start uh, to, to think about it is to look at their, how they actually handle fruits and how they feed on fruits and seeds. So looking into elements of, of natural history of fruit birds is very important for us to understand how they can affect plant population dynamics. And one basic way of thinking of these interactions is exactly so how they feed on fruits. One, a first, a first type of interaction that we see in plant fruitivores interactions is fruit eating. So I'm gonna call them fruit eaters. I'll refer to fruit eating. So those animals, they ingest entire fruits, right? So for example, we have as many birds or also large bodied fruitivores like the tapir or fish, uh, uh, reptiles as well. And because they ingest the entire fruits, they can disperse seeds and those ocorically. So while they feed on the fruits, while they move around, they are treating the, 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 seed, the fruits in their guts and they end up depositing seeds far away from the source because they have uh, sometimes long retention times in their guts. And they are, they are considered the, the real mutualists of the system. So, as I said, because of these, for example, large bodied fruit forests, they have long, longer retention times, and this um, contributes for dispersal at long distance. But uh, even large bodied fruit forests, they have different movement patterns. So, the way they, they move around complement uh, the, the special effect of uh, each other. So, we, we have this here in this paper, for example. Uh, a study that is very interesting that shows that um, tapirs and murikis they they complement each other in the role of uh, shaping special distribution of plants, and they also have a very strong effect on germination because seeds are being treated in their guts. And even though there is quite some variation, as and we, they found in this study for the Miconia genus. There is quite some variation of the, on the effect of the, uh, on germination of plants, of seeds, but it's still most of them, they promote at least some, uh, some degree of benefit to plants. We then have pulp eaters. Those animals, they do not feed on entire fruits. So fruits, fruits don't need to fit in their mouth or beak. So they feed only on the pulp and then they discard seeds afterwards. And because of that, they consider the cheaters of the system because they consuming a um, plant resource without a, an associated benefit. 
And because of that, probably they largely dismiss it in frugivore studies. And this includes, for example, a classic example of pulp eaters are primates, but also some piscita seeds and also small birds that can't that only take a bits of the of the pulp. But we know we've accumulated research that uh, pulp feeders they actually they have a uh, they have an effect in these systems. For example, in this study, they show how pulp feeders affect alter subsequent interactions. And in this study in particular, they show that uh, the effect of pulp feeders is mostly negative because by consuming pulp. Uh, legitimate uh, uh, seed dispersers do not feed on the fruit, so it reduces seed, dis seed dis survival. But pulp eaters can also have positive effects on plants. For example, in this study, they show that macaws are actually extremely important for forest regeneration and connectivity by, by in connecting fragments by transporting seeds ectosochorically. So you can see there that there are some fruits that uh, they talk out the pulp and then the seeds are intact and those seeds regenerate, they, they establish it into seedlings. So are they really cheaters if uh, they can affect both negatively and positively uh, seed region, uh, plant regeneration? And we then have the seed eaters that I mentioned in my, in my first and my second slide. So those, the main food target uh, are, is the seed. So they feed on the seeds and because of that, they consider seed predators. Also in the, when they eventually uh, disperse seeds, they consider low quality seed dispersers because they can move seeds very short distance. So they consider the antagonist. But again, we also know that those animals can actually, uh, interactions with those animals can involve benefits for the plants. Because seed caching animals, for example, they cache seeds around their home range. And those seeds that are buried into the soil, into the ground, they actually benefit from this and they establish into seedlings. So here we have an example of this study that I did that um, we see a, a palm seedling right there. And then when I was searching for the seeds, the seeds are, are cached. So those caches really result in seedling establishment. And also we know now that uh, uh, seed eaters like the, the agouti, the Central American agouti, for example, can disperse seeds at long distance. So we have uh, advancing technology to to track seeds around, we can see that those animals actually can be very, very important dispersers. And not only seed caching animals, so even animals that uh, would not uh, cache seeds like this Arara Zoo, this Yetzinti Macau, they can also disperse seeds by holding fruits on their beak. And why would they feed on the fruits? On the seeds, some of the fruits fall and then they disperse seeds. And it's really effective and important for, for some plant populations. So I also question here whether they're mostly antagonists of the seed. So as we can see, this recent research challenges this mutualism antagonism duality. And Rater suggests that the outcomes fall along a continuum. So what we probably have is that uh, different animals uh, in different frugivore guilds, and by frugivore guilds, I mean seed eating, pulp eating, fruit eating, they can affect the pulp, uh, plants in different ways and uh, with both costs and benefits associated. And, but what influences this variation of ecological roles and what are the main mechanisms that are behind, in this, uh, behind these outcomes? how they can affect different demographic process. So the goal of, um, of this work, I, this work I aim it to, to investigate how feeding behavior can affect interaction outcomes, how variation in feeding behavior can affect interaction outcomes. And uh, what are the mechanisms driving outcome variation within and among feeding interaction types? And also the, those effects uh, on plant demographic process. 
And I then we'll talk about uh, the implications of uh, looking uh, into types of feed interaction and animal traits and variation of interaction outcomes to have a new perspective uh, in for, of forgivery. And also discuss what are the, how those forgivory guilds can affect population and ecosystem dynamics. And I will finish with some insights into co-evolutionary dynamic, uh, dynamics of ecological interactions. And the group I work, the group of plants that I work with are palms. And I've been working with palms for quite some time by now. And uh, palms are really emblematic elements of tropical forests. No? So they are pantropically distributed and they're very diverse. So there is around, uh, around 2,700 species distributed in the world. And they are really fantastic group to work uh, with forgivery because they are widespread, they have a large variation of, of fruit traits and also uh, they, how they occupy the different vegetation strata. They also crucial resource for several frugivore species. And because many of those of palm fruits are large fruited, they're highly dependent on animals for seeds for so. And my study area is the neotropics. So I'm talking about neotropic palm frugivore interactions here. And we have a huge diversity and abundance of palms in the neotropics. And for this work, this is the, 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 the framework that we use. So basically, it involved the screening articles to look for, for interactions between palms and fruit bars. But uh, not only uh, not only including them as forgiver interactions, forgiver interactions, but also trying to extract from papers whether they which parts of the fruits they feed animals feed upon. So whether they feed on entire fruits, only on pulp, only on seeds. And then I compiled also information on some traits that are relevant for each one of those fruit bar gives. So for fruit eating how they process the fruit and whether they detect it or regurgitate the seeds. For pulp eating, I look into how animals handle the fruits. So their fruit handling ability, because that might interfere the ability that they have to, to, to peel the, the fruits and take out the pulp. And for seed eaters, I look into whether they, they show seed catching behavior and also the way they can handle fruit. And from the articles, I also into, uh, extracted interaction outcomes, and both, uh, whether, both for both, including both quantitative data and qualitative data to uh, classify interaction outcomes as positive or negative and dual. But uh, here I'm going to only present those results for positive and negative outcomes. And then the idea was to summarize all this information that is available from field work to in different ways. So to see how species, at the species level, how fruit birds, um, the, the interaction outcomes for fruit bird species, but also at the family level, uh, according to the feeding type and at the trait level, to see how these outcomes are all along the mutualism antagonism continuum. And uh, there is this huge amount of uh, information available and uh, that reviews a really impressive diversity of interactions between palm, the tropical palms and frugivores. So almost 500 frugivores species feed on, on fruits of 167 palms. And this is just a, 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 a part of the diversity that is of palms that we have in the, in the Americas. And we can see here that these are just some examples of the animals that feed on, on palm fruits. The majority are birds, followed by mammals and fish reptiles, but mammals, they interact with more palm species than birds, even though they're not the most diverse group that I could record. And when I try to, so for, for, to, because the goal of this work was also to look uh, at fruit bar gifts only for, from all the almost uh, 4,000 interactions that I compiled, a third 
1,043 interactions had information in the free part. So this shows also how we tend to generalize the frugivore interactions, just the animals that feed on, on fruits, but we do not specify how they feed on fruit. And here we can see that the variation of feeding type is seen only in mammals and birds. All records that I could find for reptiles and fish include the uh, fruit eating interactions, but it does not mean that uh, interactions necessarily result in positive outcomes. So outcomes vary regardless, uh, regardless routine feeding interaction type. And when I, when we were trying to understand how outcomes vary according to the trait of frugivores within frugivore guilds, we found that most palm species actually benefit from interactions with fruit eaters. So fruit eaters are really important legitimate to this person. So in this graph, uh, we have on the x-axis uh, the proportion of positive outcomes. So more than 50% of positive outcomes for each of these taxonomic classes of frugivores show that the animals uh, act mostly as mutualists. And less than 50%, they act mostly as antagonists. And uh, so we see that for, for fruit eating, the way they process the, the, the fruits does not affect that much the proportion of positive outcomes. And the same goes for pulp eating, in which we see that the animals uh, tend to positively affect um, was uh, to bring benefits for the plants. But when we see seed eaters, we see that they do fall on the antagonistic side of the continuum. And that the way they handle fruits and whether they present caching, seed caching behavior or not does tend to affect um, the, the proportion of positive outcomes. So animal traits do influence how interactions result. And then the main goal of the study was to look how, to understand how different animals, both uh, fruit bird families and species, how they fall along this continent and how much variation is represented there. So this continuum, I'm showing you the, the, the entire figure, but I'm then gonna talk uh, about each part separately. You can see that this continuum it shows a lot of variation for both families and uh, any species. And uh, again, on the right side of the graph with blue, dot, blue points, we have the animals that act mostly as mutualistic. And the, on, the left, on the left side, we see the animals that uh, are mostly antagonistic. And first, to, to, to show variation within, among families, right? And within families. So we could find the information for 17 frugivore families that represent a total of 170 species. And some of them, six of them are fully mutualistic, six are predominantly mutualistic and five are mainly antagonistic. So, and there is a lot of variation. So the lines and the gray dots, they show variation within the family. So each gray dot shows the species within the family. And those that don't have line because all species in the same family were considered mutualist. And this is interesting when we look at it because what we see there is that some families that are traditionally considered antagonists, they're actually most mutualistic. And this includes the the Dasbrectidae, the Cutidae family, the, the, the Cutia family, actually the family that includes both Agutis and Acuchis, and also parrots that are really considered seed predators, seed predators. So we see that they actually uh, play very, they can play animals in these families can play positive uh, roles for palms. So aggregating, aggregating this kind of information reviews other, uh, some things that we can't see when we, when we work with one species or another. And also some families are mainly antagonists and those, it happens to be uh, seed eaters. So 
sorry. So what we see here is that uh, the, the families that are considered mostly antagonists involve spine rats and peccaries, squirrels, and also Cervidae family that are deer. So when we look at the other side, we see that also some are mostly or fully mutualistic. And those fully mutualistic um, includes many examples of uh, what we call legitimate dispersers in the literature, like uh, the Hanfastidae family, that is the Tukan family, and also Cressidae and Cotingidae, and also Trusts, and um, some carnivores. And uh, what we weren't expecting was to see the, the, the Delphidae family there, the family of the opus, opossum. So it's really interesting when we start aggregating outcome information, we see this, uh, how animals actually act uh, as important mutualists for farms. And when we go to the level of the species, and here I'm talking about uh, the qualitative, qualitative continuum. So we've uh, compiled data, qualitative data for this continuum. We see 34 fruitivar species. And uh, many of them, uh, most of them, I would say, no, many of them are fully mutualistic. 11 are predominantly mutualistic and seven only are antagonists. So the fully mutualistic ones, we can see those, those species that are in general large bodied frugivores and mostly birds, but not only birds. We can also see there the, the, the Quatsi, Nasua, Nasua, and also the crab eating fox, but also some very fascinating animals are important uh, dispersers, uh, frugivores, mutualists for farms like the oil bird and the umbrella bird and some other animals that uh, are really recognized as effective uh, seed dispersers. And this outcome, uh, this, sorry, this continuum also shows that some of the species that we pretty much always classify as fully mutualist, like the tapirs, they actually not right there and that's fully mutualistic. So there are some negative effects that also are associated to interaction between farms and the peers. And even though there are some uh, species, seven species that are mostly antagonistic, none of them is fully antagonistic, which shows that there are always some benefits that are associated to uh, when, when animals interact with, with um, fruits or seeds. So there again, we see some animals that we, we often classify as predators, right? The, the peccaries, also the squirrels, some turtles, and also one agouti. But again, none of them is, is fully antagonistic. So some benefits associated there. And uh, what are the sources for this? Uh, interspecific variation in outcomes because those species that fall somewhere along the continuum, um, they, they interactions with them can result both in positive and negative outcomes. And what are the source for the variation? So when we get to the good stuff, the data that we can look at the proportion of, uh, of seeds that are predated versus the, those that are dispersed or seeds that are that are viable after interaction, those that are not viable. Then we can see that uh, animals really play different roles. And again, none is fully uh, antagonistic mm -hmm. or mutualistic. And what are the source for this interspecific variation of outcomes? So Probably what we see there is that animals, they, so they interact with, with seeds, pulp or fruits in the same way, pretty much, but the effects are still different. So probably what, the, what we have here is the effect of fruit trade. So when we think of, of um, interactions with palm trees, for example, for the aguiti, we found that uh, when they, they, they predate upon seeds of Eutapidulis, for example, that have a relatively thin endocarp, then those interactions result in situation. 
Also, it has been reported the same for Sagres Romans of Fiona. But when they interact with fruits that have thick endocarps, for example, the Estrocarium apolitissimum, the Iri palm in the Atlantic forest, they actually very important to a list because many seeds are cached, not recovered, and they establish in the city. And the same when we look at the Arara Zoo results, the Ascent Macau, that we see that the 11% of Atalea clary seeds are predated, but when we look at for, for Mauritia flexosa, they really feed on this fleshy pulp and they leave seeds intact. So they, there are more positive benefits associated in this interaction. And for the tapir, it's very interesting for the lowland tapir because what we found is that uh, outcomes also vary both uh, when they interact when they interact with different palm species, but outcomes can also vary for the same palm species. So, for example, for Atalea maripa, they can they they mutualist uh, in both of these study cases, but they the the proportion of uh, of positive effects vary. And also for Sagrosomas of Fiona, they can either be mostly antagonistic or mostly mutualistic. So what, uh, what we found is that uh, besides palm traits, and I'm gonna go into this uh, later, but uh, that uh, I want to emphasize how these frugivore guilds and they, they, they really have different effects on seed to seedling transitions. And when we pull all three parts together as one single group or as antagonists or mutualists, we are really missing information there. We're losing information there because variation is everything. And we see that there is a lot of variation of the mechanisms that are behind these outcomes for each three bar cube. So fruit eaters, for example, uh, in, in terms of seed viability, animals affect uh, seed viability in different ways because fruit eaters, they can masticate or mandibulate fruits in their mouth already affecting seeds if they, they seeds are not, uh, don't have a, a thick uh, seed coat. And uh, for, but for pulp eaters, that doesn't matter much. It matters probably more how, how they can handle fruits and whether, and they can clean fruits really well because when pulp eaters feed on fruits, on pulp, on fruit um, pulp, if there is, if the seeds are not well cleaned, if the pulp is not completely removed, uh, uh, this can promote attack by, by pathogens, for example. So the way they, they feed on, on the pulp is very important, has an important effect on seed viability. And for seed eaters, also, it depends really on how they, 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 they handle fruits and how they, they catch, so whether they catch seeds or not. For the seed deposition where we can incorporate dispersal, they also uh, from, they have different effects on this stage of seed to seed transitions because the way they disperse, they move seeds around is different. It's either endosochorically as in fruit eating or exosochorically as in pulp and seed eating. And also when the animals catch seeds, they can disperse seeds um, in, in multiple steps and then promote a long distance. And finally, they also, there, is, there are also different mechanisms that are associated to the seedling establishment of farms that vary according to those fruit values. So it's really, really crucial, I think, I believe that uh, we look at those interactions with frugivores and, and incorporate elements of natural history to understand the, how interactions differ. So there is a huge diversity of ways of interacting with, uh, with palm fruits. And the, most of them are neither antagonist or mutualist, and there is a lot of variation. So instead of classifying animals as antagonist or mutualist, it's really important that uh, we can quantify interaction outcomes, right? Because this is crucial to, for our understanding of how those animals can affect the plant population dynamics. And this is also very important 
to avoid misrepresentation of ecological roles, as we've been doing for, for example, for rodents and, and parrots, classifying as the, the, those animals as the predators, and, but they actually can bring some benefits. And we need to incorporate those benefits to understand the plant population dynamics. And also this, this perspective of a mutualism antagonism continuum account for, accounts for variation, which is very important, especially now that uh, we have, uh, we work with large data sets and often we, we lose sight of what each record means. So we really need to try to incorporate variation to work with large data sets as well. And so what, are, what is the, the relevance of, uh, of this kind of perspective into forgivery and outcome for, for plant population dynamics and ecosystem dynamics? So one first, one first, importance, uh, one first uh, important point about uh, looking at variation of interaction outcomes is that we review that uh, fruit eaters are, not, uh, of, uh, are often not fully mutualist, pulp eaters are not neutral, and seed eaters also act as mutualist. And this kind of, 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 of perspective into interaction outcomes. It's really interesting, for example, to incorporate in the study of uh, complex ecological networks, right? And here I show for these two examples of the study that incorporate this variation of, uh, of outcome for the same uh, uh, frugivore system. And on the, the, this study from Beno Simons, for example, they incorporate the interaction type and they classify it as dispersal pulp packing or seed predation, which is uh, quite on the way I, I talk uh, this, I, I did my, my review. And this was a very inspiring work, of course. And uh, they show that the removal of uh, non mutualistic interactions increases nestedness and connectances and decreases robustness. So this shows how by not incorporating these uh, uh, elements of natural history, when we are looking at the plant frugivore networks, we might be missing something of what shapes the structure of, uh, of, uh, of these networks. So they, they highlight in this, in this work how important it is to to incorporate the natural history into the study of networks. And below we see also a, a another study that embraces the, the mutualism antagonism continuum. And they show that uh, um, incorporating outcome of interactions uh, affected the, the, the structure of ecological networks and that this has a strong effect on community stability, how we understand the community stability. So those are just some examples of uh, how incorporating, incorporating this variation can affect our understanding on the, of the structure of uh, ecological networks. A second point that I'd like to make is that even though fruit eaters are considered the most legitimate seed dispersers, pulp and seed eaters, they can actually promote long distance dispersal events. So there, this has a huge relevance for the study of plant population dynamics. And we know that, for example, in this very nice study of Matias and Mew de Modern Pedro, they show that uh, the loss of the megafauna led to the shortening of seed dispersal distance. So when megafauna went extinct in the Pleistocene, um, those very large fruits, including palms, they lost uh, what we thought that uh, we think that they were the main uh, seed dispersers of this plant. So this has led to a change in, in plant population dynamics already. And what we see now is that losing the last, ex the last uh, megafauna herbivores that we have in the neotropes, for example, the tapir, will even decrease um, it will decrease even more this, this, the frequency of uh, seed dispersal, long distance seed dispersal events. 
And this is really important uh, if we think that uh, climate change, for, for example, can affect the, the range uh, that uh, it, palms can, for example, palms can uh, establish. So this work by Lilian Salis is also a, a very nice one in which she shows that uh, they show that uh, climate change will reduce uh, suitability for, for a, a palm species. And I think it's a type of dualis here. So the seed dispersal events by fruit forest, it's very crucial that they, for those palms to track climate suitability. And even though we attribute, again, long distance dispersal events to fruit eaters, the pulp eaters and seed eaters can also have a very important um, role for these plants to track uh, climate suitability. And also some fruit eaters that are less studied, for example, fish. We have here two examples of uh, work that uh, shows actually that the fish can disperse seeds at very, very long distance. And this might, they might have a very strong uh, effect on, on colonization of palms in the Amazon, for example, where, where many palm species grow uh, along, the, along the streams. And also parrots, for example, they can disperse seeds long distance. And again, they are good here, as uh, Patrick Janssen and colleagues showed for this uh, in, the, in Panama. So it's very important that we consider the, those animals as long, uh, long distance dispersers. And we also found when we were compiling information uh, for the dispersal distance of palms, we, we found that uh, although fruit eaters are indeed the ones that most frequently are associated to long distance dispersal events, um, the cita seeds, uh, also play an important role in dispersing these palms. And here we have two photos of um, these two different works that uh, show the importance of how animals carrying fruit in their beak is really important. Uh, uh, they can disperse it at very long distance. This is very important finding because we often look at uh, plant fruit borne interactions uh, by trait matching, size matching roles. And those animals actually can, do not need to feed these large fruits in their mouth. So they actually disperse very long, very large seeds. And this also has an impact for ecosystem dynamic and functioning. If we think, for example, on carbon storage and nutrient cycling. Are those uh, fantastic papers also from Galetti's uh, group? They show that uh, the nitrogen cycle and carbon storage is affected by fruit bark. So if, if we lose those animals that disperse seeds, we have a strong impact on the carbon, on carbon storage and nutrient cycling, for example. And as I said before, we tend to attribute the most important role in these cycles for large bodied fruit bark because they can feed on a wide range of fruit size. They, but fruit eating is highly limited by size matching groups. But this is not true when we think of pulp and seed eaters. And Pedro, me, and uh, uh, Alexandra and Poliana, we also, we, we, we've shown how agutis, they can actually disperse uh, seeds large seeds even more frequently than the last extant megafauna herbivores like some large primates and the tapir. So those animals are not uh, only antagonists. They have really very important uh, role, positive role on plant population dynamics and also on carbon storage. And uh, we also found in this paper I'm presenting that uh, for palms, Animals that feed on large uh, seeded palm species, like those that we see on, the, on this figure on the, on the right, like Atalea fruits or Astrocarium fruits, the, the largest ones are 
dispersed and consumed uh, by mainly or only by pulp eaters and seed eaters. So those interactions are less constrained by size matching rules and it, they show that those animals can have a high contribution to carbon storage. And finally, I'd like to mention how integrating this inter and intra specific variation um, of fruit trade selection by animals and also the variation of outcomes can uh, help us to understand coevolutionary dynamics and in ecological interaction. So this is what I've been doing more recently. And I'm interested in looking how animals, how different fruit bar yields select for fruit trade. So in this figure on the left, for example, we can see that uh, the animals, the, the type of fruit that those animals, uh, different fruit bar yields they feed upon, they differ because what is the, the, the reward for each one of these type of interactions is different. The basis for those interactions is different. So those animals tend to select for different fruit traits. And depending on the fruit traits, the interaction outcomes vary. So to understand how animals potentially select uh, for fruit traits, and shape uh, the, the evolution of fruit trees in, in, in palms and in other plant groups as well. I do believe that we need to incorporate this differential fruit selection by feeding yields, and also uh, the variation of interaction outcomes to really understand how coevolutionary dynamics happen in plant fruit for interaction. And coevolution and frugivory is often a uh, not um, conformed for many, many systems, mainly because we believe that there are conflicting selective pressures because there is a huge diversity of animals that uh, tend to be generalist. And they, those different selective pressures tend to, uh, to cancel one another. And then we don't see a pattern, but I do believe that for us to understand how those animals shape uh, uh, fruit evolution, fruit rate evolution, we need to consider those conflicting uh, selective pressures to really understand how they can shape the fruits. And one exciting new paper that was published by Christopher Johnson this year, very recently, I think, uh, brings uh, new ideas also to investigate these coevolutionary dynamics in plant fruit bar interactions. And they, for example, here they show that natural selection um, tends to favor mutualisms over antagonisms. Then when animals change behavior or the way they interact with flowers, and then a mutualism occurs, a suite of uh, phenotypic traits evolve from it, and thus kind of fix the mutualism uh, in this dynamic. So this is, it would be fantastic testing this kind of, of uh, co-evolutionary transitions from antagonism to mutualism in these systems of plant fruit bar interactions and to see how variation in outcomes drive the evolution of both reward and defense traits in plants. Exactly because there is this, this transition from antagonism that involves uh, the evolution of defense and the mutualism that involves the evolution of rewards. And about the defense traits, we know in this fantastic work of the Taiwan colleagues that uh, they show that um, there is an associated evolution of fruit size that is linked to the reward in palms and spine that is linked to defense. So there is quite some nice thing that we can do uh, to understand the uh, palm fruit bar um, interaction systems in particularly and also other plant fruit bar systems. So that we understand how fruit bars uh, promote species of tropical palms, which has been that has been shown, for example, by Hans Einstein. But we need to integrate this variation of uh, fruit bar gifts to understand uh, more clearly how how this huge diversity of uh, of fruit traits may have uh, uh, evolved in response to to fruit bars. So just to conclude, I don't know how. If I if I I'm past the time, but um, to conclude, uh, fruit bars they can 
play really important roles on citrus seedling transitions, and uh, it's very important that we take into account that mechanisms differ among feeding use. And uh, I hope that I convinced you how important it is to incorporate natural history elements to really understand how um, animals can shape complex uh, dynamics and in, in ecological communities. And that's it. Thank you all for listening. And also thanks Daniel, to Daniel Kisling, who is my co-author in this paper. And of course, uh, the, the fantastic work that uh, people that go to the field and compile a, a information on interactions. And this is just, uh, this is so important, so important that we do that. And uh, if we can add the extra layers on this kind of, on this field work to add information of how animals really feed on fruit forest, really go into the details and it, I think that will help us, uh, Will, will help us to understand those, the, the, the role of fruit birds on, on plant population dynamics. Thank you. And I'm open for questions. Thank you, Carolini. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Tayo, uh, you can start. If, if you prefer to ask in Portuguese, there is no problem. Yeah. Okay. Danny's first. Ok, so, Denis. Não, não, Thay, pode perguntar primeiro. Ah, beleza, então. É, Carol, é. fantástica a palestra. Estou tô, tô muito ansioso para ler, ler esse artigo. Assim, tipo, nossa, muito bonito mesmo. É, uma coisa que, 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 me, que me fascinou foi os diferentes resultados, né? dependendo do se a palmeira tem um endocarpo ou não, né? Que é uma parada que eu nunca tinha parado para pensar, mas faz total sentido, né? O jeito que a gente come uma banana é diferente de a gente comer uma uva, né? Ou uma melancia, tá ligado? Isso é uma coisa... E daí eu fiquei me perguntando se você viu outras características das palmeiras, além do tipo, tamanho de fruto, coloração, você viu como se relaciona com, com os bichos. Mas assim, ó, maravilhoso. Ah, obrigada, Thay. É, sim, na verdade, para esse estudo, eu foquei nas características dos animais, né, em termos principalmente de comportamento. Mas o que eu tenho feito, eu, primeiro eu olhei para o papel do, das características funcionais dos animais e o que eu tenho feito ultimamente é olhado para as características das palmeiras para entender como é que, essa, o, o, da perspectiva da planta, como é que as características funcionais dos frutos afetam as interações. E sim, é, eu olho, eu, eu, eu compilei, a gente tem aquele o Palm Traits 1.0, né, que tem várias características, mas eu compilei outras que eu considero que são fundamentais para para que influenciam o resultado das interações com diferentes guildas de frugívoros. Então, é, o, o endocarpo, como é o endocarpo, diferentes características do endocarpo a cor, a estrutura externa dos frutos também, porque isso influencia muito o quanto que você pode comer um fruto inteiro, se você tem que tirar a casca, então tem que ter um tipo, alguma habilidade manual mínima. É, então, eu estou tentando incluir o máximo de outras características. Depois, isso é um prazer, poder, posso te mostrar o que eu tenho feito e as, as características que eu compilei, porque estão saindo de resultados bem legais, que mostram que realmente diferentes é, guildas de frugívoros selecionam por diferentes, selecionam diferentes características. Porém, a, a forma como eles selecionam essas características, os critérios de seleção são diferentes. Então, de acordo com o que, que eles consomem, com a, ou é a forma. É legal. Oh, valeu, vamos conversar assim, com certeza. Sim, tá obrigada. Danny? Um, Ishao, I, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to ask Portuguese because I'm still confused with my own question. <laughs> é, é, Carol, eu adorei sua apresentação, cara. Achei seu trabalho muito bacana. Imagino que deve ter sido um grande trabalho coletar esses dados, né? É, e eu, eu tenho duas perguntas. 
vou fazer a primeira miúdo, e aí depois você me coloca no final da fila, e se dá tempo eu faço a segunda. Mas é o seguinte, quando já você... Já faz fala... as duas, Dani, pode fazer as ah, duas. Faz uma, a Carol responde, aí você já faz, tá bom? Tá. Porque acho que o do Hernani já foi respondido. Ele tava me avisando no YouTube. Tá bem. É o seguinte, quando você falou sobre a extinção da megafauna e o quão essa perda de grandes dispersores pode implicar em questões ecológicas, o que eu fiquei pensando é assim, quando a gente pensa nos grandes dispersores e na capacidade deles levarem as sementes em distâncias maiores, é, quando você pensa numa floresta, como a floresta amazônica, onde você tem ainda um fragmento muito contínuo, eu imagino que esses grandes dispersores devem ter um papel bem importante. Mas quando você pensa em, em Mata Atlântica, onde a gente tem um processo de fragmentação florestal muito grande, onde algumas áreas conservadas ainda são muito pequenas para o que deveriam, é, pra, em relação ao que deveria de fato ser, hum. tudo é borda, né? Então, até que ponto grandes dispersores eles teriam uma importância tão grande em áreas como a floresta amazônica, se você tem flag fragmentos florestais super distantes e que talvez a presença desses dispersores não não exerça um papel tão marcante na, na dispersão dessa, desses, dessas sementes, porque tudo é borda, né? Você tem um espaço tudo enorme. É não consigam transitar. É, não, é muito interessante a sua pergunta, Dani. E eu acho que são realmente processos diferentes. É, um, o que um frugívoro faz dentro de uma floresta contínua e, a, e, e qual é o papel do frugívoro dentro de uma paisagem fragmentada. Mas tem vários estudos que demonstram que esses frugívoros é, que dispersam sementes a longa distância, na verdade, eles são muito importantes eh, em paisagens fragmentadas justamente porque eles conectam populações que estão isoladas em diferentes fragmentos. Então, isso tem um efeito positivo eh, impressionante na estrutura genética de populações, por exemplo, porque a única forma eh, de, 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 de haver variabilidade genética dentro dessas diferentes populações é se animais conseguem transportar as sementes através das paisagens fragmentadas. Então, um dos estudos que eu mostrei, eu acho que foi é, lá, na, lá no início, perdão, aqui, esse daqui. Eles mostram que a, a dispersão de sementes por essas, é, por essas araras é fundamental né, em paisagens da Amazônia mais fragmentadas, porque elas conectam populações entre fragmentos. E dentro da, da, das florestas contínuas que você comentou, Outros processos podem levar à distância e é, longa dispersão, como, por exemplo, a, a, as cutias, que são, que são demonstradas, que de, é demonstrado que elas podem dispersar as sementes em várias etapas e, assim, é, as, as sementes chegam a longas distâncias da, das fontes. Então, eu acho que, dentro de paisagens fragmentadas, realmente é, os animais acaba na verdade acaba o que acaba sobrando são animais que dispersam sementes às vezes a curta distância e mas eles ainda são importantes para conectar fragmentos isolados Entendi? Ah, sim sim o que eu imagino é só que esses grandes dispersores talvez eles tenham de não ser tão sensíveis à alteração ambiental em áreas muito fragmentadas para eles conseguirem transitar às vezes de uma mata mais conservada para um fragmento mais é, antropizado. Com certeza, com certeza. Isso, isso, e é, é por isso, na verdade, que existe uma perda de diversidade genética né, em, em ambientes fragmentados, justamente porque realmente esses animais são, tem, eles, eles não resistem a essas pressões de fragmentação antrópicas e acabam é, sumindo as perdem os dispersores que são capazes de atravessar, uhum. conectar fragmentos. Tá, eu vou fazer minha segunda pergunta, que eu não, eu não sei nem se chega a ser coerente. Assim. É, cê, na palmeira, você tem os dispersores que dispersam principalmente os frutos que ainda estão na parte superior, ainda estão presos ali, e você tem principalmente os, os mamíferos né, que dispersam os que já estão caídos. Em termos de é, viabilidade, eu não sei se viabilidade seria a palavra certa, mas tem algum estudo que mostre que a, se a qualidade, não é a qualidade da dispersão, é a qualidade da germinação e da viabilidade da semente varia em relação àquelas que ainda estão presas e aquelas que já, já caíram, 
que elas estariam, sei lá, mais suscetíveis à ação de fungo, alguma coisa desse tipo? Ana, essa pergunta é muito interessante. Eu também sou estou muito interessada em olhar para essa variação, a localização onde os frutos estão, quem consome eles, mas o que, que acontece com esses frutos que estão é, em palmeiras altas, que ocupam a copa das florestas, mas eles estão acessíveis para os animais que frequentam a copa, mas eles caem. Então, eles também estão são acessíveis para os animais que estão no chão. E existe para algumas palmeiras, eu trabalhei com uma no doutorado, Astrocário Paramacá, que o fruto é, é decente. Então, ele é, fica fechadinho, inacessível, e ele só fica acessível quando o fruto abre e a semente cai. Então, existe esse tipo de, de, de influência da, que a planta parece que força é, o consumo da, da, das sementes, mais ou menos isso, é, no, no chão da floresta. E, sim, a, 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 muitas vezes os frutos estão maduros na copa e, quando eles caem, eles estão muito mais suscetíveis à ação de patógenos, porque também esses patógenos ou invertebrados eles atuam... É, com, eles respondem à, à densidade né, do, dos frutos. Então, quanto mais recurso daquela mesma palmeira ali, os patógenos acabam, é, é, a, acabam de reduzindo a viabilidade se esses frutos não são retirados logo. Então, provavelmente tem um, alguma coisa de viabilidade de, ao longo dos estratos. Isso é muito interessante, Juliana. Super, obrigada. Nada. É, Pamela? Oi, Carol, obrigada pela fala. Ah. E eu adorei aquela a imagem que tu mostrou, a figura que vocês fizeram para esse trabalho do contínuo, do antagonismo do falismo, eu achei maravilhosa, maravilhosa. <risos> Depois, quando a gente conversar cara a cara, eu vou querer que tu me mostre em detalhes, Sim. por favor. <risos> e uma coisa só que eu estava pensando uh, é que eu achei, assim, na minha cabeça, enquanto tu estava apresentando, eu fui formando a ideia e eu pensei que as aves provavelmente seriam as que teriam essa, esse maior... estariam no maior contínuo para o lado mutualístico, com certeza. É. Eu achei isso. Mas eu achei que, sei lá, os tucanos, as penélopes, enfim, essas aves maiores estariam um pouquinho mais e as aves menores um pouquinho diferente, assim, um pouquinho mais para o lado menos um, sabe? Tipo, não tão próximo do um. E daí eu fiquei pensando que uh, numa coisa que tem nos dados da Marina com a dispersão de euterpe, que o, alguns, uh, duas espécies de sabiá, elas eram muito importantes para o componente quantitativo, então elas, elas tinham uma frequência bem alta visitando e consumindo os, os frutos de euterpe, só que elas também, essas duas espécies, elas desperdiçavam bastante. Então, elas deixavam muitos frutos caírem embaixo da planta mãe, sabe? E daí eu fiquei pensando, será que tem como fazer esse zoom e incluir esses dados, esses tipos de dados, assim? Porque, ok, elas são muito importantes no componente quantitativo, mas talvez não tão importante nesse componente mais qualitativo da, desse, desse disperso efetivo, né? Não sei se tu acha que seria interessante, tu acha que teria esses dados para algumas espécies, provavelmente, talvez? Com certeza. Não, isso é... Eu acho que essa variação que é a graça desses sistemas, assim, porque tem, tem muita variação e tem também muita variação é, espacial do papel, né? Então, como um, um, um mosaico geográfico, às vezes, dos outcomes, dos resultados das interações. Então, e, por exemplo, o que você está falando... Eu também incluí para algumas espécies de pequenas, pequenas aves esse hábito de pulp packing, né? que é só te dar umas, umas bicadas na polpa e aí os frutos caem. Então, elas, por isso, muitas vezes, elas não são tão efetivas. E eu não sei quais são os dados depois que, você, que você tem exatamente, mas eu acho que sim, seria interessante se você puder... É, e tentar incorporar incorporar essa variação você disse que quantitativamente elas são importantes ela, é, essas qualitativamente etapas... elas não Isso. são né? é ela não chegou a medir essa coisa qualitativa assim de distância de voo alguma coisa mas assim mas como cai mas, ali né então é. aí ela não considerou por exemplo um evento de dispersão sabe ela tem esses dados ela... é, eu acho eu acho que muitos muitos estudos às vezes, 
a gente subestima o papel dessas pequenas interações é, uhum. para o sistema como um todo, assim. Que eu acho que eu também o que eu estou tentando reforçar, de que é, mesmo quando não existe dispersão a longa distância, isso não quer dizer que não tem benefício associado para as uhum. plantas. Isso é legal, se você puder depois me mostrar isso, a gente conversar, de repente dá para ter umas ideias de como olhar para essa, essa variação aí, em termos de componentes da, da efetividade de dispersão. Sim, sim, super. Obrigada. Obrigada, Beleza, eu vou, o Leandro faz então a, a última pergunta e a gente termina por aqui. Carol, depois a gente conversa, eu tenho várias perguntas. Ah, eu tenho uma coisa que eu fiquei curioso, eu vi que vários, é, for, for some pairs of species, like for the both uh, tepper uh, species and both uh, agouri species, There is a, a lot of variation in the in the degree of, of or how mutualistic are the interactions they, they they create. Do you think that this is actual a pattern, like a species level difference between these close related species, or this might be uh, some bias related to the the sampling yeah. of species interactions in this in, the, in these species because there is a lot of variation uh, especially is, for the yeah. tapper and the agouti yeah. yeah yeah i agree there is a, there is quite some variation and i think that in in part it can be by a uh, sampling bias but i also think that for example i the palm the the agouti that uh, was on the antagonistic side of the continuum is the zipracta leporina which is mainly found in the Atlantic forest, for example. So, or it's largely found in the Atlantic forest. So there are context dependent factors that may play a role on how those agutis are, uh, are reported as, as antagonists. So I think that there is that. And, um, and other than that, I also, I don't see much how those very related, uh, closely related species could play different roles other than explain it by context dependent factors. I think that's it mainly because uh, it's shown now for also uh, by, there is a paper from 2009 with Georgie and how it that shows that how fragmentation turns a mutualism uh, in antagonism because there is less fruit available so then agutis, they instead of caching seeds for later consumption, they just eat everything right away because that there is no much for them. So that, that is important. Well, thank you. Uh, thank Leandro. You for... <laughs> Carol, tudo bem? Nossa, tudo eu, bom. Eu gostei muito, muito mesmo da sua palestra e eu estou muito doido para ler esse artigo também. Sim, eu quero muito <laughs> ler ele. <laughs> todos e, nós, a... Leandro, todos nós. <laughs> é... A minha pergunta vai na linha assim, do que a, a Pamela, e acho que um pouco o Mildo comentou também, que que me chamou bastante atenção foi aquele contínuo que você mostrou e como os diferentes grupos caem ali nesse contínuo né, de, dos outcomes das interações mutualistas ou antagonistas. E você mostrou que tem isso, essa figura é maravilhosa. <risos> E o que me chamou bastante atenção nessa figura é que você tem vários grupos que estão ali para a direita, que praticamente 100% do ótimo das interações é, é mutualista, e você tem grupos que estão muito mais para a esquerda ali, e você tem grupos que estão meio que no meio do caminho, né? É. E uma coisa que eu fiquei pensando é, pelo que você conhece né, desses grupos e da história natural dessas interações, se você pensa que esse meio do caminho... É, ele está sendo mantido por algum processo ativo, ou se ele simplesmente, se os grupos estão no meio do caminho, eles simplesmente estão no meio de algum tipo de trajetória evolutiva direcional, que eventualmente vai levar para um desses dois campos. Essa pergunta é fantástica, e eu também, principalmente quando eu olhei esse, o resultado desse contínuo, principalmente do meio, dá para ver que tem um cluster de, de, de espécies ali, né, que estão... É. Chegando no mutualismo, e na verdade eu acho que eu acho que para essas espécies, se você reparar bem no, nas espécies que tem ali, que são antas, pacas, é, macaco prego, alguns ratos de espinho, o bugio, 
o Ti, a Arara, essas aqui que eu estou falando do, do meio, né? Não sei se vocês estão vendo uhum. o meu mouse, mas essas aqui. Ah, estou bem, sim. Essas são espécies altamente estudadas. São talvez as espécies que mais, mais estudadas. Então, eu acho que ainda tem um, um, um viés de, de quantidade de, de informação que a gente tem. Então, quanto mais informação agregada, mais a gente vai ver que algo, nem todo mundo é mutualista, nem todo mundo é antagonista, e por isso que tem um resultado é, que mostra que essas espécies... Elas são primariamente mutualistas, mas elas também têm algum efeito negativo associado para a semente, porque tem mais estudos. Mas é, eu acho que isso também tem, é, em parte, é, deve ser explicado, sim, por, por questões de, de, do, do papel delas de forma geral. Por exemplo, tem é, os, os consumidores de semente, principalmente são consumidores de semente e consumidores de polpa. E eu acho que tem uma variação do papel ecológico aí. Agora, é, é muito interessante se olhar se elas, como é que se isso, se isso, na verdade, sinaliza algum tipo de transição de um antagonismo para um antagonismo, porque elas estão tão bem ali, né? Obrigada pela questão. Eu vou pensar nisso. Imagina, muito legal. Obrigado. Obrigado. Ai, Pessoal, nós temos mais uma pergunta. É no YouTube que eu esqueci de ver aqui. Peço desculpas. É, primeiro, obrigado, Papo por me chamar a atenção aqui, que tinha mais uma pergunta, e desculpa, Gabriela, vou fazer aqui a sua pergunta. É, é, Carol, parabéns, é, da Gabriela Akeni Oda. É, parabéns pela excelente apresentação. Como você disse, podem existir variações no, em traços dos frutos entre diferentes populações que irão influenciar na interação com os frugívoros, certo? Quanto isso é variável? Você considera essa variação dos traços sobre um olhar das palmeiras significativo? Se sim, como controlá-lo? É, beijo grande. Gabi, obrigada. Legal assistindo. Com certeza, tem muita variação é, de características das palmeiras, principalmente para as palmeiras que têm é, distribuição, né? de, de uma distribuição mais ampla. Então, por exemplo, eu tenho para uma... Eu não sei se é a Thalea Maripa, que vai do Atlântico ao Pacífico, e a variação de características dessas palmeiras é impressionante. E eu acho que isso tem a ver tanto com, com provavelmente, um fator de não ambiental selecionando essas características, mas também dos frugíveos. E a variação das características, com certeza, influencia como que essas interações resultam. Então, é muito provável que tenha alguma dinâmica coevolutiva aí atuando pra, né, nessa variação. E um paper que a gente, que eu publiquei, eu sou coautor junto com o Tim Lenters, que também estava apresentado naquele congresso de Palmeiras, talvez você tenha visto, Gabi, é que quanto, quanto mais a gente conseguir incorporar essa variação intra-específica das Palmeiras, eu acho que a gente vai começar a entender como é que como é que os animais selecionam por frutos diferentes, como é que as palmeiras respondem, quais são os efeitos para essa emergência de mutualismo e antagonismo. Então, acho muito, muito relevante é, em pesquisa de campo, por exemplo, fazer, acessar, investigar como é que essas características variam e como é que elas podem influenciar os resultados das interações com o frutos. Fantástico, Carol. Muito obrigado aí pelo, pela sua palestra. É, acho que todo mundo ficou super interessado, interessado em ler essa, essa revisão. Parabéns por esse trabalho gigantesco. E, e eu acho que foi. É, vai dar, vai dar muita discussão ainda conversar sobre sobre como incorporar essa variação é, tanto na dinâmica ecológica quanto evolutiva. Isso parece muito, muito um caminho super interessante e agora você Sim. criou alguns fundamentos para que, que todos nós possamos pensar no assunto. É, obrigado a todo mundo pela, apresenta, pela presença online <risos> e é, essa semana ainda temos outra palestra da Laura Leal é, na quarta-feira e, e até mais então, gente. Um bo uma boa Obrigada, semana para todo mundo.